Welcome everyone. I'm Rachel Scott and I'm a member of the Left Forum Board. I'm here today to open a day-long homage to the work and life of Leo Panitch. Leo was integral to the Left Forum as a member of the advisory board, a long-term participant and supporter of its annual forum and the forum's ongoing presence as a gathering point and place for the international left to congregate share ideas and continue to struggle for a better and more egalitarian world. We've constituted this six hour program divided into remembrances of Leo from two of his closest friends and collaborators, Greg Albo and Francis Fox Piven. Following these remembrances, there will be three panels with moderators that will extend the vast contributions of Leo's life work into the present conjuncture. So we have a full day ahead of honoring, remembering, and extending the work of Leo Panage in our struggle for a new society of economic and social equality, one that builds qualitatively different human relations in the post-pandemic era. I had had the good fortune of meeting Leo for the first time on the Greek, first and only time, on the Greek island of Kassos in the summer of 2019. He was participating in a Marxist summer institute there, and he offered his vision of the socialism to come and emphasized the necessary struggles for transformation, both within existing political institutions, as well as the necessity of ongoing confrontations from the outside. I found him to be a magnanimous individual, a scholar of first rank, and a deeply caring and committed man who wanted to build an alternative political space and a new world of human relations. I wish I had had the opportunity to know Leo better. In the spirit of the memory of Leo and today's events, I would like to ask all of you to help maintain the Left Forum as a viable alternative space for envisioning and building a better world by donating what you can to the Left Forum. Today's event is the first of several in the next year, leading up to an in-person conference in May of 2022. Our next conference is actually next weekend on Saturday, June 12th, uh, entitled Planetary Crises, Building Struggle, and it begins at noon. Please register. We on the left need a gathering place and an ongoing educational project to consistently confront and transform the latest crisis in rapacious capitalism and its disastrous effects into something radically different. I encourage you to become a sustainer of what Leo believed in and tirelessly worked for. Please contribute and we promise to remember Leo well and work incessantly to build a qualitatively different world. We will miss you, Leo. Next, we will play a short clip from Leo speaking at the opening plenary of the 2015 Left Forum. And following that, we will turn it over to Greg Albo. Thank you. The victory of neoliberalism, the very, very active state that has brought neoliberalism capitalism about, it's been a regulatory state. It's a state that has codified the rules of markets and applied them to all of us. But the, that neoliberal state, the flip side of it, is the defeat of the left. The defeat of the great working class institutions, the defeat of trade unionism, in the same period that we've seen the rise of neoliberalism. It's the flip side of the coin. And it's involved the defeat of the great political movements of the left of the 20th century. What is happening now in Europe and I'm sure this will happen again and again in the face of the irrationality and the chaos of contemporary capitalism, what is happening in Europe is the reemergence of new creative political forces on the left. This has happened before. It took some 40, 50 years between the Chartist movement of the 1830s, between the revolutions of 1848, 
which were for the most part defeated, until the great working class parties, the first permanent organizations of subordinate classes in history, there had always been bread revolts, usually led by women, there had always been slave revolts, but the first permanent organizations of subordinate classes emerged between 1890 and 1920. That didn't just happen, it emerged out of a confluence of struggles and movements that went on between the 1830s and 1840s and then coalescing into those great parties of the 1890s of the beginning of the 20th century. The story of the 20th century is very much about the achievements of those parties the revolutions they made, the reforms they introduced in capitalism, and the contradictions they ran into, and the mistakes they made in the face of those contradictions. And what the New Left was about in the 1960s everywhere was a recognition that the communist and social democratic parties that emerged in the late 19th century had run their historical course. They were no longer capable of transformative change. There were attempts inside the communist parties through the Euro-communist tendencies, inside the social democratic parties to democratize those parties, most famously in the British case with the Benite movement, the Greater London Council saying, unless we democratize the party, we can't democratize the state. Those attempts failed. Those attempts were defeated. Okay, thanks uh, for that clip, which is always a bit uh, breathtaking, uh, hearing uh, Leo uh, speak again. Uh, uh, it still takes my breath away and uh, what difficult. Uh, thanks to Left Forum and Socialist Register for organizing uh, today's sessions. Uh, Leo died in December uh, of last year after uh, uh, gaining, uh, contacting um, uh, COVID on top of uh, being treated for multiple myeloma. Uh, it was a, uh, it was a, quite a shock uh, to all of us. Uh, that summer we had wrapped up the, the Socialist Register. Uh, and I began planning as it goes, you know, we, at the end of the year, we often sit around and get a bit drunk uh, or maybe over lunch sometimes and, and start thinking about the next whatever period. And we've been napping out ideas for politics in the city and the register for another decade. And then more concretely, actually putting in plans for things for a couple of years. And uh, those ended up coming to naught. Uh, as you can imagine, it's been a, a very difficult uh, number of months uh, of adjustment for a lot of us who were in uh, and part of Leo's collaborative networks, political networks, intellectual networks, his students and so forth. Um, it's still very difficult to uh, uh, comprehend and cope with. Um, I've had a long period of collaboration with, uh, with Leo uh, around the research interests, uh, editing, writing, uh, politics, in a sense, it began uh, before I'd actually met him, uh, following about uh, 10, uh, I guess it was about 15 years on the heels of, 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 a, of a celebrated class at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, which included Sam and Leo and a bunch of other comrades. Uh, they were a legend <laughs> still <laughs> 15 years later. We shared many of the same professors, uh, participated in similar political organizations huddled around Canadian dimension, a uh, whole range of things that kind of, uh, uh, it was like Leo was uh, collaborating and mentoring, even though I had not yet met him. Um, I had moved to uh, uh, Ottawa and, and Carleton University uh, to study with Leo just before he actually uh, 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 left for Toronto. Uh, immediately, actually, upon meeting him, uh, uh, I ended up uh, re-meeting uh, Michaelis Portalakis, uh, and uh, that was a collaboration I was glad to strike again and also join the political group he was part of with Leo, the Ottawa Committee for Labour Action, which kind of 
led to this kind of mixing uh, for my life, uh, the politics and research and teaching and so on. It was a, a, a great period. I actually began right away uh, working on a couple of projects with Leo. One of the book uh, with Donald Swartz uh, was a research assistant. And then I cl collaborated with him on writing a, a major paper for the, the famous McDonald Commission in Canada in the early 1990s, uh, sorry, early 1980s that became part of the, the, the ruling class shift towards uh, free trade with the US and so forth. We were, uh, as you could guess, we were the dissenters, <laughs> the Marxists that were allowed to uh, <laughs> contribute to, <laughs> to, the, to the study uh, and so on. I moved to Toronto and New York in the 1990s to start teaching there. And then immediately we began sharing kind of research projects, uh, graduate supervision, teaching and so on. Um, and then in 2011, uh, uh, well, actually, we worked on another volume of the, of the Socialist Register earlier than that, when 2010, 2011, joined Leo in collaboration in editing the Socialist Register every year, uh, at that point in time, also with Vivek Ch Chibber, uh, which we then did 11 volumes of the Register together, and then alongside that, another 10 volumes of, of, of other works that we put together over this span. Coming to Toronto also kind of brought me into uh, collaboration and, and regular contact with uh, Sam Gindin and the Canadian Auto Workers, which kind of there then began overlapping our work together in politics and activist networks uh, across country across the country, uh, or also internationally, uh, and that was kind of like a became at that point in time coinciding with daily email <laughs> meant that you kind of began this period that lasted for 15 years and more uh, of kind of daily kind of back and forth on the events of the day. Uh, it, was an it's been, it was an incredible period of collaboration with Leo, sharing work, uh, sharing politics, sharing friends, uh, sharing struggles, sharing defeats, sharing a few victories here and there, sharing students, and so on. It's an amazing experience. Leo was a great collaborator. Uh, in almost everything he did. Uh, that was kind of his life, uh, in, a, in a way he lived life so big, uh, not just as, as you saw from that short clip, how big a presence he was when speaking, but he lived life big. Uh, uh, his major works uh, were all collaborations with Don Swartz, Colin Lees, uh, uh, Sam Gindin. Uh, he collaborated with uh, many of his students regularly on other projects. Uh, Socialist Register was, of course, uh, an edited annual uh, with collaborations with people from around the uh, from around the world. And Leo had begun collaborating with uh, Ralph Miliband regularly and edit and as as co-editor, beginning in uh, 1984 with the uh, and the first volume coming out in 1985. This was something also of the sensibility uh, that both Ralph and Leo brought to the Socialist Register. Uh, uh, and, and some of the characteristics that have been in its pages since. Uh, this was, uh, you know, was if, if centered on the non-aligned left uh, uh, and, the making, uh, and the making of a new left, uh, the pages of the register were always open to uh, uh, people uh, active in Trotskyist formations, uh, to the non-Stalinist Communist Party, members to uh, Maoists here and there, to left anarchists, uh, to left social democrats. It was, you know, an attempt uh, to uh, collaborate with all the traditions of the left in the making of a new socialist politics. Um, there was also, a, 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 you know, as part of this, a willingness to think about a new anti-capitalist politics as being the core of this project, which also meant recognizing explicitly that the organizational forms of, of uh, the historical communist parties and the command economies they, they, they governed over were at an impasse and were not a route, road ahead for the left. And also clearly that social democracy had uh, reached a certain impasse in, in, in relationship to capitalism becoming integrated into capitalism in, in, in the management of a mixed economy. The theme of, of, of Miliband's uh, uh, 
great book on parliamentary socialism. Um, I think uh, uh, this was also then a continuous attempt at exploration of the ideas and movements that were uh, animating the socialist uh, movement, uh, uh, obviously anchored uh, in this case, particularly in the North, uh, the Anglo countries, but never only limited to that, but slowly and steadily and, and always integrating the struggles for liberation, decolonization, against imperialism, against war of all the progressive movements around the world. I think it was uh, these same themes and sensibility that drew Leo to the socialist uh, uh, scholars conferences and the left forum uh, meetings in New York City annually. Uh, he began, began attending every year from the early 1990s on. Uh, the last one uh, in person held in, uh, we both attended in Brooklyn in 2019. Uh, he loved coming to, to New York City, let's be clear. He loved coming to New York City. <laughs> that was clear. <laughs> uh, and it was an occasion to catch some jazz. Uh, if Eric Canepa was around, there would be occasion to have an incredible meal at some obscure restaurant. Uh, uh, there was all these kinds of features about coming to, to New York he really loved, as well as, of course, the panels, the book tables, the debates, the arguments. Uh, and with Leo, uh, being the incredible network he was, it was a way for him to keep in touch with kind of all kinds of friends and comrades uh, uh, across North America in particular, but also from elsewhere. Walking around Left Forum with Leo was, I don't know what you would call it. <laughs> and he was kind of stalking, talk, stopping and talking to everybody, uh, of course, with his height. Everybody could see him when he was coming, so it was easy to kind of pick him up, and if you want to say hi to him, you could catch his eye, and uh, uh, being the generous person he was, he was always a talking way, so if we were having to make a session, I sooner or later was from way down lower, <laughs> being much shorter, pushing him from behind to get going, <laughs> and <laughs> otherwise we're not going to make it. Uh, but that was partly, I think, what uh, was the charm of left form for both of us, uh, that mix of things. And uh, it, it would be so good if we could uh, uh, keep it uh, going. Leo's research spanned so many things in terms of pamphleteering, public talks, uh, uh, and had a number of phases. You know, first phase dealing with social democracy and industrial militancy over the post-war boom in the 1970s and, and uh, 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 the contradictions of that phase in terms of uh, the social democratic parties. A second phase dealing with the crisis of social democracy and the emergence of neoliberalism, bringing with it a transformation in state practices and a crisis of the party systems. Uh, these are the books on from consent, to, from consent to Coercion, the Crisis of Working Class Politics, the end of parliamentary socialism, and a whole slew of essays that were in the pages of the Socialist Register. Uh, a third phase from the mid-1990s to 2000s on the, on the forms of the new imperialism, the contradictions of financialization and state policy, which of course emerged in the great book that he did with, uh, with Sam Gindin on the making of global capitalism, which was authored by Sam and Leo, no doubt about that, but it was also interesting that it spawned projects from students. We ran a, a, a research seminar called the Empire Seminar uh, loosely for uh, I think more than a, a dozen years about, which kind of spawned a whole bunch of, 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 of associated projects. Uh, uh, a great, a great experience. And a last phase dealing with the conditions from remaking working class politics in unions, parties, movements, uh, all kind of anchored in, in, in some notion of, a, uh, of, of products of projects of radical democratization in, against, and apart from the state. Uh, these were the last books he uh, authored, The Search for Socialism uh, with uh, Colin Lees, uh, The Socialist Challenge Today, co-authored with Steve Marr and Sam Gindin, uh, Direct Interventions in the Politics of Today. 
The sessions uh, organized today, sponsored by Left Forum and Socialist uh, Register, I really think capture these themes well. Uh, the general title, Beyond the Socialist Impasse, arguably could, could encapsulate the theme of, across Leo's entire career uh, in the same way it, to some extent is a theme that would could encapsulate much of what uh, uh, Ralph Miliband wrote about too. Uh, the sessions I think capture the phases I just uh, spoke to, reimagining socialist parties and, uh, and practices, debating socialist strategies and uh, in the post pandemic period, the state and global capitalism. Left Forum and New York City has always served as a destination for uh, uh, not just the US left, but also the, the international left. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of, of uh, collaborators and comrades over the years from uh, Latin America also send their greetings to us. And hopefully this is a, a, a great day. Uh, and they send their greetings in memory of, 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 of Leo and the, much of the speaking and support work he did for comrades and struggles in Latin America as well. I'm going to turn it over to Francis, uh, a longtime friend, collaborated with Leo, and actually, for sure, one of the main reasons he really enjoyed uh, coming to New York City was a chance to uh, have a meal and share some discussion and, and no doubt, vigorous debate <laughs> with Francis as well. So, Francis. Thank you, Greg. I'm so glad for this opportunity to talk about a friend that I really loved. And, you know, I want to talk, I want to talk about an aspect of Leo, which we all knew and which we often don't talk about. We talk about Leo's work, his work as editor of the Socialist Register, his work with Ralph Miliband, his many books, his work as a socialist intellectual. And that's true, and we're gonna hear a lot about that today, but there is, that's not the reason that we all loved Leo. We loved Leo because he was such a generous, happy person. He was so good. He was a moral person, and he was a person who knew how to be happy and how to enjoy life. And that was so distinctive because, you know, we're all, most of us are academics. Academics are not people who know a lot about being happy, being generous, being kind, being loving. Academics tend to be isolated and competitive. You know, they count up their articles like people counting up their gold coins. Not Leo. Leo was so exuberant, so open, so loving. You know, I met him when he was 24 years old. There was a conference at Columbia University and Leo I remember Leo standing up in the middle of the sort of circle of chairs of people who were there to talk about some very erudite thing, I don't know. And what I remember about Leo, aside from how tall he was, I remember him insisting in his little speech that the economic was determining in the last instance. There was something so charming and funny about this insistence. And I didn't become friends with him immediately, but over time, I would go to Toronto, he would come to New York, and I got to like him and love him more and more. So that by the last 10, 15 years, Leo had become one of my best friends. You know, I'm an academic. Most of my other friends are academics. Some of them are organizers. I tend to like them better. But academics have certain deficits as people, I think. We are uh, isolated and competitive. 
we work alone. We count up our articles, our prizes, our mentions, our citations, like as if they're gold coins or something like that. And we get kind of sour and competitive and we worry about people sort of stealing our ideas. I don't think Leo was that, like that at all. I think Leo would love it if people stole his ideas, shared his ideas. He was a happy person. Now think about that. How many of your friends do you think are happy people? Probably not a lot of them. Leo was so happy. He was so happy because he loved his students, he loved his friends, he loved his family, he loved his wife. He loved to eat, he loved good food, he liked to drink his scotch, remember the scotch? He loved jazz, that's why he liked coming to New York so much, so he could go to Harlem and to his favorite jazz places. And he always did. Now, why can't we remember the exemplary Leo Panitch? And he was exemplary. We should all imitate him. We should all try to live like him, not only for his work on the social register, his work with Ralph Miliband, his many books, his work with Sam Gindon, but for the kind of person he was, the joy that he just exuded the joy in life, the joy in friends, the joy in family, the joy in food, the joy in jazz. I think that that's also something to regard as exemplary, as something we should learn from, something we should follow. And I also think that this this quality of openness and generosity had implications for the kind of theorist that Leo was. Implications because Leo changed his mind and he did it easily. It didn't, wasn't a big deal. He didn't, he didn't hoard his ideas or his work and he, cling to them. He was ready to listen to another point of view. I don't know of any Marxist theorist that was as flexible and as tentative, as ready to look at it another way as Leo was. So we should Remember Leo, love him, and we should take lessons from Leo, not only on how to live, that's important, but on how to be socialist intellectuals as well. Greg, who goes next? Thank you, Francis. That uh, absolutely captures Leo. I'm sure there's like half a dozen of us, uh, more than half a dozen, given this is Leo, hundreds of us nodding our heads <laughs> to that uh, remembrance of his, uh, of, of, his uh, of his spirit and his joy for life uh, and so on. And uh, it should all of us should take that uh, uh, to heart uh, as, as we remember his work and debate his ideas and debate our own politics and our own situation where we're at. I'm going to turn it over to Peter Bratzis, who's chairing uh, the first session on, reimag uh, on uh, reimagining political parties in practice. So Peter, do you want to take it over and, and yes. be introducing the panel and, and uh, conduct the next hour and a half of discussion? Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Greg and Francis. Um, I had the, the pleasure of knowing Leo from uh, 1997 onwards, uh, as probably most of you know, 
Ralph Millibin's um, last academic affiliation was with uh, the Graduate Center at, uh, at CUNY. And after uh, uh, Ralph passed away, we organized a conference on state theory uh, where, of course, Leo spoke and uh, Francis spoke. Of course, she was one of the participants, uh, Clyde Barrow and, uh, and many others. And after that, uh, we had regular uh, contact. I was trying to figure out how many times we were on panels together or spoke together at conferences. And I think it was too many for me to remember. Three times I remember it was in Greece a uh, few times in London, and then many, uh, probably almost every year uh, at the Socialist Scholars Conference or at the Left Forum uh, uh, in New York City. And of course, many, many meals and discussions. And I think uh, Francis is exactly right. One of the things, one of the reasons why all of us in, enjoyed being around Leo and uh, participating in discussions with Leo was because he was uh, so open. You know, he was in the academy, but not of the academy, in a sense. So, you know, as, as I'm sure uh, mo most of us know, uh, the academic mindset is one where if you disagree, you know, they, it's taken more often than not as some kind of an insult, you know, that there is some kind of disagreement. That wasn't Leo. You know, he was very quick to tell you if you disagreed and he was very open when you disagreed with him. And, and you know, I remember ve many very lively discussions um, um, and that, and, and I think that's part of the, you know, uh, uh, not being of the academy, you know, continuing with a certain working class sensibility and openness, as opposed to a kind of petit bourgeois uh, pettiness and careerism that so often, again, as Francis pointed out, uh, characterizes uh, academic work. Um, and I think part of that also was his willingness to get his hands dirty in practical political issues. You know, I remember uh, 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 when in, in those years where Syriza was building towards its uh, electoral victories and its struggles uh, in uh, 2015 and previously, many left academics or more than one told me that we can't get involved because when things go wrong, as most of us know, it's usually the case in left struggles, things usually go wrong. Uh, uh, we don't want our names associated with that kind of a defeat. And of course, that was not Leo. He, he was, he knew, you know, you cannot be a Marxist intellectual, especially someone who is an expert on the theories of the state and, and, uh, and political sociology and not know that it is almost inevitable that the struggles fail in many, you know, in many key ways. And it was, even before Syriza's electoral victory, that it was very possible, you know, probable, obviously, that things would not work out the way most of us would have hoped they would. Nonetheless, he was very uh, uh, engaged, very quick to, to lend his name and support to the struggles. You know, Leo was very involved, not only in the, in the Greek political situation, of course, but also in England, you know, through his connections to uh, Ed and, and David Miliband and others, and he was always willing to uh, uh, leave the ivory tower, you know, step down from uh, uh, from uh, uh, the role of the scholar and to engage uh, uh, in, in these practical political issues and problems. Uh, and I think in, in that sense, uh, this panel is in many ways the most difficult uh, uh, to, uh, to figure out because uh, for uh, Marxism or any kind of social science, after the fact, it's easy to analyze what happened, or it's easier at least. But when it comes to being prescriptive, trying to figure out what could happen, how to avoid possible pitfalls, how to learn some strategic lessons from the past, uh, it's much, much more difficult. And again, Leo was not uh, shy about taking on these difficult uh, questions and uh, a, a tr and being a participant in trying to figure out how to move the struggle uh, forward. So we have four speakers today. Uh, let me just introduce uh, them all and I'll introduce them in the order where they'll be speaking. The first speaker will be Steve Meyer, who uh, is a frequent contributor to Jacobin and is the co-author of the Socialist Challenge today, Cedizar uh, Corbin Sanders. Uh, Megan Day will be the second speaker who is a staff writer at Jacobin and the co-author of Bigger Than Bernie 
how we go from the Sanders campaign to democratic uh, socialism. Uh, Mikhailis Purdalaikis will be the third speaker. He is uh, currently the Dean of the School of Economics and Politics at the University of Athens, and he, uh, where he also teaches sociology, and he is a member of the executive board of the Nikos Polanzas Institute. And the final speaker, who is, I think, many hours behind many of us, he's on the west coast of the United States, uh, will be Arun Gupta, uh, who is a journalist and is was the founding editor, editor of The Independent and the Occupied Wall Street Journal. His articles have appeared in the Washington Post, The Nation, The Guardian, and Jacobin, and who is currently working on a book on food and the social construction of taste. Uh, so the first speaker will be Steve. Uh, the speakers will speak for about uh, 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. And we, then we should have about 20 to 30 minutes for some uh, debate and discussion. Steve. Thanks, Peter. Um, and thanks to the Left Forum for organizing this and, and, uh, and inviting me to participate in this panel. It's, it's, an unfor it's, it's a very unfortunate circumstance to um, have to be here, but nonetheless, I'm glad that Leo could bring us all together here uh, once again, one last time, perhaps. Um, when I look at the names on the on the program, I, I'm reminded of so many different times in, in Toronto at the Victory Cafe when people would come from, from out of town to, to speak at a conference or an event and met, met so many of you guys uh, at the tables there uh, over a couple of pints. I remember Peter and others always coming. I remember I met Fran Piven for the first time in Leo's Kitchen in 2014. And I, it was the first of many moments over the nearly decade uh, long period that I worked closely and collaborated with Leo, where I kind of had to pinch myself because someone whose stuff, whose work I had read so so closely and knew so well, was all of a sudden this real flesh and blood figure like in his in his living room or uh, uh, in his kitchen. So uh, I'm glad to to see everybody again. Um, and for those that I don't know, uh, nice to meet you, and I hope that we can be together in person uh, again soon. Um, Leo and I worked together for about a decade. Um, including collaborating on the past eight volumes of the Socialist Register and working closely on activist work in Toronto. Uh, I have the unfortunate distinction of being Leo's last PhD student um, and also the co-author uh, with Sam Gindin of his last essay in the Socialist Register um, and the co-author with Sam Gindin of his second to the last book, um, The Socialist Challenge Today. It's still hard to believe he's gone. Uh, I still have a hard time accepting that that's real. Um, up until his very final days, we were exchanging emails on a daily basis from his hospital room, debating and discussing the political crisis in the US that was unfolding uh, at that time with the end of the Trump presidency. Um, it's losing Leo. I know many of many people here uh, were very close with Leo and I can say for myself, you know, Losing Leo has been the hardest personal loss that I've ever faced. So um, he meant a lot to me and I'm glad that to see that he was able to, to mean so much to so many people and the many re remembrances that have flowed out since his passing in December. So to turn to Leo and the socialist in past today, um, what does he have to tell us? So much, I think, about, about, how to, uh, about left politics and socialist struggle today. Um, Throughout his life, as, as we saw in the clip from the left forum, Leo was driven by the search for a new politics, which basically meant acknowledging, as he said, that the Leninist and Trotskyist vanguardist style parties did not represent a way forward for the left. Um, they had achieved certain things, but they had at that time, as of that time, still failed to build a substantial base in the working class, anything like what would have been necessary to stage the kind of insurrection, armed insurrection and overthrow of the state that those parties see as the primary focus of socialist strategy. So we had to move beyond the legacy of 1917, even as we took its important lessons, we had to move beyond those lessons to, to craft a new socialist politics for a new moment. So that left the, 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 the difficulty of overcoming the limits of social democratic parties and social democratic politics, which had been the main alternative to the Leninist and, and Trotskyist parties uh, put forward by, by left, uh, uh, put forward for left politics. Social democratic parties, as Leo's work showed, had 
failed already by the 1970s, despite their achievements over the post-war decades in improving working class living standards, expanding the welfare state, achieving universal health care, pensions, unemployment insurance, nationalizing industries. Despite these achievements, Leo's work was already showing how in the 1970s, when he emerged as a leading critic of those parties, that these parties had failed to affect even any kind of initial movement toward a fundamental transformation order. They were incapable, he already saw at that early time, of mounting the kind of challenge that would be necessary, not only to transform capitalism, but even to sustain the reforms that they had already won. Uh, that was because these parties, and that was, in a, that was not a, a matter of a contingent matter of happenstance of history. It was part of the DNA of those parties. It was, it was an effect of the way they were structured, the way they were organized, and the kind of political vision that they put forward and how limited that it was. These were, these were top-down bureaucratic parties who relegated workers to a passive role in you know, supporting candidates by voting, by knocking on doors, by getting out the vote, and, and no further, it did not envision any further forms of, of struggle beyond just those kind of passive supports for the party technocrats, who, once they were in office, would achieve for the workers the greatest deal that was possible within capitalism by tweaking through macroeconomic policy uh, the kind of uh, uh, political compromises that were possible with the work with the ruling class. And so they were committed to a politics of class compromise. And in the context of this politics of class, class compromise, they, socialists were systematically marginalized in these parties. Even though socialists remained present in those parties, they were systematically marginalized as unserious, as possibly jeopardizing the gains that, the, that these parties had been able to achieve. And so the problem, um, you know, despite the fact that socialists were there, dem challenges mounted by those socialists to democratize these parties came to naught. And that was already clear that that was, that that was not going to work out as a strategy for the left by the 1970s as Leo was writing. The basic issue was that these parties were not cultivating the democratic capacities and the creative energies of the working class necessary to achieve a transition to a socialist society. And since they had accepted that the reforms that they had achieved were to remain dependent on corporate competitiveness and private capital accumulation, by the time the 1970s crisis, the fiscal crisis of the state and the profit squeeze crisis, these parties saw no alternative but to embrace cuts and restructuring, hoping that normalcy would be restored, competitiveness would be restored, capitalist growth would be restored, and then those reforms that they had won previously could be reinstated. So they had to cut the reforms in order to save them, uh, was the initial way in which these parties began to move to the right, starting in the 1980s and then culminating in their open embrace of market reforms through the third way in the 1990s by which time they became key forces in institutionalizing neoliberalism. So Leo was incredibly prescient in recognizing already in the 1970s that social democratic parties did not represent a way forward for socialist transformation. Another way had to be found. So the challenge then was how to build what Leo uh, referred to as a party of a different kind. And in this respect, he was very fond in his many talks and essays of quoting Robert Michels, the famous political scientist, Iron Law of Oligarchy, which basically held that however democratic their internal organization may be, political parties will inevitably come to be dominated by an elite group. Now, while Michels cast this as an iron historical law, Leo saw this as the fundamental challenge for the left. How can we build parties that can avoid falling into these kind of oligarchic tendencies, that can avoid being dominated by an elite clique? or a technocratic clique and instead cultivate a groundswell of democratic creative energies by the rank and file participants, involving people in politics in a new way and enriching people's perspectives and ability to change the world. The fundamental danger for Leo of a left party that would, that would try to initiate this kind of new kind of politics was social democratization. The idea that reforms would end up being seen as ends in themselves rather than means toward building toward a more fundamental social transformation. That, that, that these parties would be transformed by the state 
rather than transforming the state, which was the fundamental objective that these parties, that, that any new party, new kind of politics should, should set for itself. So he was very encouraged, as we all know, by the examples of Podemos in Spain, Blanco in Portugal, and Syriza in Greece. He sincerely hoped and was ex excited that these parties might remain animated by the search for a new kind of politics, committed to socialism while avoiding the pitfalls of social democracy and the dogmas of Leninism. Yet all these parties are today have become relatively marginal in terms of their ability to serve as potential transformative forces, despite having really great energies that still survive around those parties, their ability to engage in a, in a kind of socialist transition, I think at this moment seems to be marginal. They've fallen prey to some extent, at least to the very same pressures that Leo warned about throughout his, throughout his work. And at the same time, he was all, we were also all excited like Leo by the emergence of Sanders and Corbyn in the US and UK. These two, these challenges too have been defeated and marginalized by the center, even though they as well have left behind important organizational and activist infrastructures that serve as the vital basis from which we have to build. This, was, this has partly been a reflection of the underlying balance of class forces. We are today faced with a paradox. Even as the working class is weak, winning even moderate reforms today demands a truly radical confrontation with capital. As Leo and Sam's work in the making of global capitalism, especially, but also there are many essays through the 1990s, has shown global capitalism has eliminated, not just in, in, in the Anglo countries, US, Canada, UK, but elsewhere as well, any capitalist class fractions that could support or be open to the kinds of social democratic class compromises that existed during the post-war years. Those parts of the capitalist class that were the basis for those compromise no longer exist. They're now globalized. They don't have to engage in those kinds of compromises because of the international financial integration and the free movement of investment that has characterized the American-led project of making global capitalism. And we're currently in a moment of generally low levels of struggle despite the mounting crises that are piling up outside. So now Joe Biden is pushing a massive fiscal expansion, $1.7 trillion on top of the $1.9 trillion COVID bill that he already uh, passed, that they already signed. So how to understand this? What are the, what are the lessons that we can take from Leo's uh, writings in order to understand how to orient toward this conjuncture for the socialist left? Clearly, Biden's initiatives, Biden's willingness to engage in fiscal expansion go beyond what we've seen in the neoliberal period. Obama's stimulus was $831 billion. I mean, this is many times larger than that. I think it's important in this context to remember that for Leo, as he made explicitly clear throughout his many writings, the issue for socialists is not a question of more state or less state but what kind of state? So the problem with Biden is not that he's not going to bring us social democracy, nor that he's not spending enough dollars on these programs. The problem is that social democracy and mere reforms within capitalism are not enough. These are not our objectives. Such reforms that as Biden has advanced are not of the kind that lead toward deeper shifts that lead toward challenging private ownership over investment, that lead toward fundamentally democratizing the state or building workers' democratic capacities. Rather, they are focused around ensuring the competitiveness of American corporate capital and the hegemony of the American state vis-a-vis -vis China. Even Biden's proposed reforms around unions, impressive and important and helpful though they are, like the PRO Act, will require an independent left to push for these to amount to something more than very narrow supports for conservative and undemocratic unions. These unions themselves have to be transformed and that can only be achieved with an independent and strong socialist left. Such a socialist left is necessary to build on any openings that do emerge and point the way toward the needed social transformation through a struggle for what Andre Gortz in his famous 1968 Socialist Register essay called Non-Reformist Reforms, an essay of which Leo was very fond and quoted from often. 
So the challenge for us is how we can connect the fight for universal health care or the reforms necessary to address the climate crisis. How can we connect these struggles to the, to the push for the needed deeper and broader transformation of the economic system so that, it, so that it serves social needs rather than private profits? That is the challenge for us today. That is how we get beyond the socialist impasse today. The danger as the Democratic Party is that in focusing on particular reforms, the question of socialist transition is postponed indefinitely, ends up serving as mere rhetoric. We have to not just pay lip service to the need for socialism while becoming focused on reforms as ends in themselves, but very deliberately craft a socialist strategy, educating people through the struggles for these reforms about the need for socialism, about how capitalism as a social system is fundamentally unable to meet the human, social, and ecological needs of our present moment to address these crises. Um, universal health care, for example, does not in itself pose a threat to the ruling class, except in so far as it serves to raise expectations and encourage workers to go further. Social democracy says these expectations must conform to the limits imposed by capitalism and the capitalist state. Socialism seeks to use reforms as a springboard for this deeper and wider transformation. Now, I think we also have to recognize that socialism is by no means inevitable. In Leo's words, I'd even bet against it. But it is only by maintaining what Leo referred to as our revolutionary optimism of the intellect, reversing the aphorism wrongly attributed to Gramsci. It is only by holding on to this revolutionary optimism of the intellect in the face of uncertainty and loss and, and, and contradictions, thinking strategically, creatively searching for openings from within our historical present that we have any hope of building a better future. As Leo always insisted, this must be guided by a sober and honest analysis, never deluding ourselves and basing our strategies on a careful and concrete analysis of the world as it is, rather than as we wish it might be. But the difficulties that that world presents for socialist struggle should not lead us to resign ourselves to merely pushing for some basic reforms within capitalism. Holding on to our revolutionary optimism of the intellect means maintaining that creative search for a path towards socialism. So um, we can take hope, I think, as Leo did, from the development of the DSA in the US and momentum in the UK. These groups, these organizations face many of the same challenges that Leo identified in relation to the new parties of Europe. But what Leo found most exciting about these developments was the creativity and the commitment of a new generation of activists to class struggle and the willingness to experiment with new organizational forms capable of giving expression to the principles of democratic socialism. This will of course be a messy process but it is to this open-ended experimentation that we must commit ourselves if we are to have a future worth living in. Thank you very much for uh, having me. Thank you, Steve. Um, Megan is the next speaker. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you to everyone who spoke before and introduced Leo. I'm honored to be here with all of you. So I first met Leo a few years ago at a conference in Montreal. It was the conference for uh, Quebec Solidaire. It was called The Great Transition. So this was not that long ago, so I'm more of a newcomer to knowing Leo. Um, but, you know, he, he decided that I was a, a good candidate for mentoring, as he did for so many other young socialists throughout his life. And because of that, I heard from him often throughout what ended up being the final years of his life. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the circumstances under which I met Leo. So I was invited to speak at this uh, Quebec Solidaire conference alongside representatives from various international socialist parties and organizations, including Podemos, France Insoumise, Quebec Solidaire, and also the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. And I was asked to represent DSA. And specifically, per the organizer's request, I was asked to speak about the political perspective and the organizing work of the Bread and Roses Caucus of DSA, which I won't go into too much internal DSA stuff, but suffice to say, um, we were all um, quite pleased when the New York Times, in attempting to describe the Bread and Roses Caucus, described us as, quote unquote, basically Marxist. We were like, Fair enough. We'll leave it. We'll leave it there. Um, so I, I 
I was at this conference and I reported what Bread and Roses in my local chapter of DSA, which was um, the chapter of East Bay, California, had been up to. Um, we had at that time run a pretty impressive electoral campaign for a black socialist working class activist named Javanka Beckles. Um, and she lost narrowly, but uh, instead of dismantling the infrastructure of the campaign, we quickly repurposed it. We had planned this ahead of time once we realized that we had the opportunity to do this. We quickly repurposed it to serve as the basis of a strike solidarity effort when the Oakland teachers went on strike. So all the same volunteers, the same lists, the same energy, the same meeting spaces that we went to and so on. This is obviously not typical for um, campaigns, which are not plugged into any kind of extra parliamentary work whatsoever, usually. Um, so, uh, you know, all of that was conducted under the political leadership of, uh, with, with, of course, many other, the, the guidance and, and assistance of many other members who were in other caucuses, but uh, the political leadership was provided by the Bread and Roses Caucus, which at that point no longer actually provided the basis for the formal leadership of the chapter, and also I think was like the hegemonic political force in the chapter at that time. Um, and so what I was explaining was that this kind of activity really puts our politics uh, into practice, the Bread and Roses caucuses, politics in the practice. The idea that we would run class struggle oriented campaigns and we would see them as vehicles for building independent socialist and working class power, which wouldn't be restricted to the parliamentary sphere. So I'm explaining all of that and um, I'm in front of a completely dark room and I can't see anybody in the audience. And suddenly I hear someone interrupting me and shouting bravo and clapping, which I almost burst out laughing because that never happens. I mean, people are usually quite quite um, quiet uh, during panels unless they've decided to stand up and denounce you, right? Um, and, and so of course that was Leo. Uh, I met him right after that and we spent the rest of the evening getting to know each other. And from then on, you know, I heard from him often. Uh, the evening that we um, that we got to know each other, I mean, I'll echo what Francis was saying. Clearly, I, to me, it seemed like he was a gregarious and generous person. I remember thinking after that night that he was the only person I was ever tempted to describe as debonair, a word that I probably never used to describe anybody else. Um, and you know, after that, I heard from him all the time. I mean, he would he would often recommend for me to be on panels alongside him to represent the perspective of you know DSA, which I found it was a it was a great honor. Um, you know, he would sort of send links and ideas, and um, he did that with a lot of people. This was not an ex this is not an experience exclusive to me. Um, I think especially young socialists who were involved, to my knowledge, in um, both the the Jacobin magazine project in the United States and the related Tribune. Magazine project in the UK um, and in the this is caucus of DSA in the US. Those were the places where he was really like tell. So the last time I spoke in, in uh, that I spoke to Leo was on another such panel, one that he had invited me to, and he challenged me on this panel in a way that I found very characteristic and. Uh, revealing. So I have been waxing poetic about the expansive and unprecedented feeling of empowerment and of living in history that American socialists and working class activists had experienced at the height of the Bernie Sanders campaign around the time that Bernie Sanders won Nevada and you know you had uh, MSNBC pundits that day likening it to, I believe Chris Matthews likened that to um, when uh, the Nazis invaded France. Uh, it, re it really felt um, like uh, we, we had him on the ropes to some extent. Um, and so I finished telling, I, I won't go into the details. I had been there, I had been in Nevada and I had, um, you know, I mean, suffice to say, there everyone everyone who was in Nevada for the for for you know organizing for Bernie um, to win the caucuses there remembers that there was literally a full rainbow in the sky that day. It was a feeling of genuine elation. So I finished telling that story, and Leo said something like, "You know, I love how Megan always talks with the passion of an activist, but you know, missing from her account is that if Bernie Sanders had won the presidential election, the American left would be in deep, deep trouble, right?" And he was right, of course. You know, Sanders would have been responsible for administering the capitalist state while attempting to transform it. He would have faced retaliation from capital in the form probably of economically damaging disinvestment. Uh, he would have received either no support or faced outright sabotage from other parts of the state, including the security state and the military, the bulk of his own party, the, the entirety of the other party and the, the mainstream media and so on. 
Uh, and plus, Bernie Sanders would not have arisen to power as we might have engineered it through the ranks of a mass movement for democratic socialism. Instead, he would be tasked with engineering one or building, building the base on the fly in the face of all of this opposition. So, you know, he was right. It would have been it would have been a big mess. It may have been a generative and beautiful mess, but it would have been a mess. And I think this was a persistent theme of Leo's intellectual contributions. The idea that the left must make every effort to organize and take state power, but we should also understand the nature of the state under capitalism and, and understand the degree to which it makes the administration of socialist politics extraordinarily difficult in the beginning stages of the transition to socialism. I say beginning stages, the truth is in all of the stages of the transition to socialism. And because of that, we have to proceed strategically and intelligently above all with the aim of developing the independent capacities of the working class to defend its gains and to govern society in its own interests. In other words, convincing people to put us into power is not easy at all, as we've seen. And nevertheless, it's still easier than wielding state power in a way that actually moves us towards socialism for all the reasons that Steve was talking about. Um, and, you know, drawing from Steve, um, sorry, drawing, drawing from Leo's work, um, you know, for me, what that means is probably for, for roughly four criteria. We have to wield state power in a way that one, foregoes the bureaucratic or technocratic path in favor of a deep democratic approach that actually fosters working class initiative and that builds the class's capacities and networks and organizations. Two, we have to wield state power, should we ever actually get it, in a way that is ideologically clear and convincing, right? We have to promote a socialist perspective and elevate class consciousness, even as that state is necessarily tasked at first with managing the complex affairs of a still capitalist society. Three, we have to administer the state in a way that stands up to capital and finance and maintains, while also maintaining the support, um, the, the support and morale of the working class, even in the event that capital's inevitable retaliation causes conditions to worsen, and there are plenty of historical precedents for that. And then four, in order to accomplish all of that, um, which is a tall enough task, the state needs to be staffed by competent and politically aligned personnel, which really isn't easy when you don't have a mass movement already producing tons of cadre. Um, and it even tends to create, uh, as, as Leo and, and Sam have, and Steve have pointed out, it, it tends to create the problem of sucking all of the cadre into the state and leaving the extra parliamentary infrastructure in shambles, which certainly won't do when it comes to defending gains, right? So all of these warnings, um, I got from Leo, and I find them very helpful and very sobering, but they, they, they didn't mean that Leo was unsupportive of the Bernie Sanders campaign in the United States or of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party in the UK. On the contrary, he was very supportive and he was thrilled, in fact, and he tended to gravitate toward young socialists who threw our lot in with Sanders and Corbyn. I think he understood that these initiatives were creating new socialist organizing opportunities and new socialist organizers who were dedicated to seizing them. I'll speak for myself and say that while I was, I, I think, relatively um, politically aware and intelligent uh, before Bernie Sanders in 2016, a crucial piece of the puzzle wasn't there, which is a sense of myself as a person who ought to devote my life to actually building the socialist movement. And I'm not alone. I mean, you see the growth of, of DSA in the wake of the first Sanders campaign. That's, that's what's happening. Um, so I think that, you know, Leo felt that despite despite the great difficulty that a Sanders presidency would have faced in fulfilling its promises to workers, i.e. despite the enormous mess um, that would have been created, you know, due in less to its own like theoretical shortcomings, though it has short the, the Sanders campaign and a, San, a potential Sanders presidency would have had shortcomings, but more to the objective balance of class forces. Even with all of that, it still had the potential overall to move the political project in the right direction in terms of you know, creating new political realities, upping political stakes, building class consciousness, and so on. And I think that uh, these, these questions were some of the main themes in Leo's writing and in his intellectual mentorship of young socialists, myself included. You know, he emphasized time and again the importance of preparing for the difficulties ahead by seriously attempting to understand how capitalism functions and how the capitalist state operates both intentionally and just reflexively uh, in, order, in order to maintain capitalism itself. 
And I think, you know, Leo also emphasized the necessity of preparing for the transition by orienting our activities toward class formation. And this was a really critical lesson that a lot of us um, took from his mentorship. As his British mentee and friend, Max Shanley, put it on a recent podcast, a podcast that was host, hosted by Grace Blakely, who was another one of Leo's friends and mentees in Britain. So you can see how vast this web is. Leo viewed class, as Max said, not just as a thing, but as a process, constantly being organized and disorganized and reorganized. Of course, class, you know, can't simply be anything that we decide to call class. That doesn't mean that class is a kind of like free-floating social phenomenon. It obviously has objective dimensions and it's rooted in the process of exploitation and in relationships, real relationships to the means of production, real locations in the economic and social system. Um, but that said, the working class doesn't spring fully formed from the system itself, right? The working class as a, as a political subject does not spring fully formed from the structure of capitalism. So transforming it from a class in itself to a class for itself is the ultimate political objective that should dictate the kinds of activities that we are undertaking. And that's the, the, the basic upshot of the idea of class formation. And class formation really reframes and recasts many of the left's sort of like constant usual circular debates. For example, on the left, we often talk about like, is electoral politics worthwhile or is it worthless? And class formation kind of interrupts the, the constant back and forth and suggests that, you know, the kind of electoral politics that takes as its aim the cultivation of mass class consciousness the knitting together of working class people into new political arrangements, the development of working class organizations and leadership capacities, uh, the kinds of electoral politics that are doing that are worthwhile. And any left project to win and wield state power that is neglecting those objectives is probably worthless, or at the very least, it's eventually going to hit an impasse that will spell its undoing. Uh, one other thing I want to say, oh, and I should add there that the on the question of, of parties this this process of class formation was is the objective of political parties like steve said not simply to win and implement reforms but to implement reforms insofar as they can they can serve as the basis for the working class developing its consciousness and capacities and skills and organizations and and sense of itself and so on um, and in the United States, of course, we have we face unique constraints when it comes to parties. Um, we're not in a position simply tomorrow to uh, create an independent party that's um, going to win much. And that's worth considering because, um, you know, if, if you've got an independent ballot line, but you're losing consistently, you do run the risk of actually demoralizing people further. <laughs> um, so that's so given that we're not in a position to simply bust out the gate tomorrow, we have to think about what are the strategies for um, serving the function of parties. The function of a party is to engage in class formation. We don't have a party and we can't have one tomorrow. And in DSA, the, the debate tends to revolve around questions like the dirty break strategy, which is to run on whichever ballot lines seems, you know, most conducive to reaching working class people, which sometimes will be an independent ballot line and sometimes will be no ballot line and sometimes will be the Democratic Party ballot line in order to build toward the possibility of a break, to heighten contradictions in, in the Democratic Party and, and lead us toward a break. Um, another idea that is thrown about that I think is related to that one, but there are some nuanced differences is the idea of a party surrogate, the DSA should actually function, try to function like uh, a party now, despite not actually being a party, because we know that a party does more than simply own its own ballot line. And my favorite anecdote to this effect is that Bernie Sanders himself left a small third party that he had been a part of the foundation of in Vermont, because as he said, this thing is only devoted to running protest candidates, you know, every so often and getting a tiny share of the vote. What about actually engaging with working class people? We're so we're so focused on like administering our, um, you know, failing little third party that we don't actually talk to working class people. That's paraphrasing, but that's essentially the story. Um, so the idea that we could behave as a party surrogate that actually um, does both engage in parliamentary and extra parliamentary work right now, despite not actually being an official party, is an idea that you do hear thrown about in, in DSA. We're trying to work through this question of how to engage in class formation and how to approximate the function of a party, given our unique constraints. The last thing that I want to touch on, um, and I'll touch on it briefly, 
about Leo is that he was really good at um, neither moralizing about nor ignoring the current class composition of the socialist movements in advanced capitalist democracies, which I think, as we know, tend to be, you know, less representative of the broader working class in terms of education, wages, job security, and other aspects of the class experience. So the terms that one often hears used to describe DSA members uh, it's like college educated, downwardly mobile, middle class millennials. I've see I've, I've like I've like memorized it because you hear it so often. And you know, it doesn't apply to every DSA member, but the trend is broadly accurate. Um, and in Leo's imagination, this is not, uh, you know, this doesn't doom us from the outset and it's not a source of like moral embarrassment, uh, but nor is it an acceptable state of affairs given the urgency of class formation and the role of working class socialists in providing leadership to other members of the class. So this was another persistent theme of his counsel, which is that he stressed the need for socialists to be embedded in working class life, you know, in its unions and workplaces, but also in its cultural sphere and in its institutions institutions of daily life and so on. Um, I'm, the other day I read a, a passage from an essay by Isaac Deutscher where it contained um, a phrase that I really liked. Uh, he said, you know, speaking to intellectuals in the new left, and he said, you know, you are um, currently effervescently active on the margin of social life while the worker is passive at its core. And this is the fundamental contradiction that you need to resolve. Um, so Leo was always very excited to see our effervescent activity, but he wanted to remind us that we were existing on the margin of social life and we always appreciated that. Um, and he was enthusiastic about, you know, certain elements of DSA, um, not least um, the Bread and Roses Caucus, um, it, are, are embracing the rank and file strategy in an effort to sort of transform unions by sending socialists into them as, as members, members who can exhibit leadership on the shop floor, but I think more importantly, as um, as socialists who can cultivate working class leadership on the shop floor, who have the ability to recognize organic working class leaders and bring people together and build up the capacities of other people. This is a crucial distinction. Many socialists have marched into workplaces thinking that they themselves are the leader that the workers have been waiting for. Um, there's a lot of discussion in DSA around those who are pursuing the rank and file strategy right now about not doing that, about um, you know being there to essentially cultivate the capacities of people who were there before you got there, right? Um, and, and I think that Leo thought he was appreciative of this, and I think that he thought we had our work cut out for us, um, to put it lightly, but he appreciated that, you know, the Bread and Roses Caucus and the DSA in general seem to be taking seriously the need to root socialists deeper in the working class rather than sort of satisfying ourselves with the degree of separation. Nor did he think that we should simply flog ourselves for being, you know, um, for emerging from the wrong class location and developing the right ideas, right? So I could, I could elaborate um, on many more important aspects of Leo's work, honestly, forever. Um, and I regret that I don't have the, the you know, uh, ability to do that right now, the time to do that right now, because this, this is enough, but this right here is just enough to last us a lifetime, right? We can mull over these questions for the rest of our lives. So I will end by saying that I think that the American socialist movement is better off for Leo's intellectual leadership. I'm very honored to have known him for a short time, and I'm very proud to be a socialist in the intellectual tradition that Leo represents, which extends you know, back through his own friend and mentor, Ralph Miliband. Um, the formations to which I'm most dedicated, um, you know, DSA and specifically Bread and Roses, and then also Jack Hood Magazine, both owe an enormous debt to Leo's guidance, both his intellectual guidance and also just his personal friendship and counsel. And to be a bit tongue in cheek, I really hope that one day, hopefully soon, the US socialist movement will advance enough and have enough agency and power to, uh, to, you know, to make a big complicated mess of everything in precisely the way that Leo warned us about, right? And I really believe that when that happens, when we make that big mess, we'll be much better prepared to, to, um, to weather the transition process than we could have ever hoped to be without his invaluable writing and his guidance and his companionship. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Michali. Hello. Uh, good afternoon from uh, Athens, Greece. A big, big uh, thanks for the organizers for taking the initiatives for the invitation and the opportunity to contribute to this uh, 
discussion to this meeting that turns to be both interesting and uh, very moving. I'm sure that no one, especially those of us who knew Leo personally, could imagine, let alone organize a discussion on socialist parties, on reimagining socialist parties without him. That is not only because we miss him terribly, but mainly because his work and his contributions are crucial to the subject of our discussion. It would not be an exaggeration to say that Leo's entire work could be described as a series, as pieces of the theoretical and practical requirements needed to help the left, the people who were and are committed to socialist transformation, to be more radical, to be more realistic, more effective and, and more optimistic all at the same time. The rigor of his research and the sophistication of his arguments in combination with uh, his normative choices and commitment made him one of the most influential militant intellectuals in the field. He offered us great insights in how to overcome the stalemate of the socialist strategy, both theoretically and practically. It is in this preoccupation that, in my opinion, allow us to read his work as a serious and systematic effort to overcome, or better, to minimize the everlasting antithesis between theory and practice. Politics to him was not limited to an analysis of the status of the, and the dynamics of the state power and, his, and its relation to the institutions of social and political representation, but was an attempt to test and understand its transformative capacity. It was this inclination that led him to devote much of his work, work to the political party as a prime political agent for, politic, for our political endeavor. The many insights of his work and the recent experience of, uh, of Syriza, which unfortunately seems to be in a process of change from a, a hopeful party of new radicalism to a disappointed party of new realism, will guide my contribution to our discussion. As an introduction to this uh, uh, debate, we have to clarify, and I, I will do that, uh, some of the assumptions that, it will, that they should guide that, that discussion, the departing points of this, this discussion. This way will allow us, these points uh, will allow us to be more productive and more creative in the, in the exercise of reimagining the social party of our day. First, to reimagine the socialist parties of the socialist party of our times, we should capitalize on the experience of the entire left. Thus, for example, we must not ignore uh, the reformist, the social democratic uh, 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 ability to govern. However, we must make it clear that in today's capitalist dynamics, there is no room even for the reforms of the all-time classic social democracy. And even more so for those social democrats who, one way or the other, have subscribed to the modernized and neoliberal logic, who they see the side effects of capitalism as the cause of our problems. See, for example, all the debate about the exaggeration and uh, uh, the rising of inequalities, etc., and the debate about the environment, and so on and so forth. Second, given the historical impasse and the tragic distortions of almost all traditions of the left movement, old and new, it is important to understand that the overcome of our to uh, that the outcome of our discussion should address the hopes and the considerations of the entire left. The unity of the left is not a rhetorical and or an opportunistic call, but a productive and a necessary task, since we need to build upon and capitalize on the advances of all the efforts of the left 
not only the last two decades, but also in of the entire 20th century, without, of course, hiding the tragic mistakes that at times led us led to our marginalization. Third, the strategic strat challenges and dilemmas of the, of the new party should not be limited to the old and to some extent dated or meaningless dilemma, reform or revolution. As Leo reminds us on many occasions, revolutionaries should be enriched the problematic of their strategy by the obligation to alleviate the pain and the, and the everyday hardships of the people and the subordinate classes which are caused by capitalist aggressions. This logic also puts an end to another meaningless puzzle that we socialists impose upon ourselves, a puzzle which has to do with the questions of whether radical socialists should get organized to assume governmental responsibilities. If the Socialist Party does not get organizationally, programmatically and ideologically prepared for such a contingency, then the left project the socialist project and us leftists will turn into hobbyists, will turn into a community of lifestyle and our collective efforts at the end will become some kind of a sponsors to a hermitism. Fourth, it is also important to be efficient and politically effective in the current conjuncture more than ever before. After its dramatic failure to intervene in a counter-hegemonic fashion during the, last, during the last major crisis in the 1970s, the left cannot afford to display the same laziness. This is especially true now that the COVID situation has forced us into paying more attention to, not just to the antithesis and the contradictions between capital and labor, but also to the questions around gender, race, and the environment. Fifth, although we are talking about socialist party, a socialist party, given the widespread uh, lack uh, the widespread uh, legitimization crisis of political parties in general, it is not as usual for many of us to doubt whether parties, and especially socialist parties today, make any sense. However, parties exist and function and act at three levels, and we should not forget that. That it is important to distinguish the party on the ground the party with its membership and its supporters, the party in central office, which is its bureaucracy, which is the cadres, etc., and the party in public office. Parties as institutions are facing major crises at the two first levels, while at the same time they maintain their critical importance in organizing and legitimizing the regime and the political system. There are no other institutions that can replace political parties. Parties are unique institutions of the society. Given their presence and involvement in the society, they can have governmental aspirations as they can translate societal protests, demands, prospects and visions into political pro uh, programs and state policies. Dear comrades, the party is not over yet. Sixth, knowing that the, part, that the party over and above else is an organization and in fact a political tool in the hands of social, of social classes and, stra and strata that it appeals to, it is crucial to make a systematic effort to build an internal organization in accordance with the current social division of, of labor and the communication capacities of our time. An organization that will be able to overcome the crisis of representation and become a democratizing force in and outside the state power. Finally, it is important that the party develops a culture 
among its cadre and members that operates on a different time frame for, for its activities and initiatives from the one imposed by the media or by the ele electoral cycles. Long-term planning for radical left that struggles to transform the society cannot, for example, aim at the, at the next electoral race. Mistakes like this lead unavoidably to, nar to a narrow vision and more often lead to disappointments and widespread pessimism. Have you said all this to me in rethinking the Socialist Party, it is particularly useful to draw lessons from the experience of the radical uh, parties that dare to cross the threshold of power in the European South and particularly the in the case of Syriza, as well, of course, in of other historical experience, especially coming from uh, Latin America. To analyze the omissions, the mistakes, the retreats in a sober, serious and non-dogmatic fashion and not based on implication and analysis that everything is intentional and should be attributed to treasonous inclination of certain individuals. These mistakes are usually made by those that belong to what I would call the platonic left, which seems to have divorced itself from dialectics. So a serious look to the Southern European experience and especially the experience of Syriza in my case can provide us with some useful pointers in rethinking social, socialist organization. Very, very briefly uh, as uh, in concluding some uh, I refer to these pointers. Point number one, given that uh, Quite often, political strategy is the outcome of circumstantial and conjunctural socio-political socio dynamics. The Socialist Party should focus on a collective and deep understanding of, uh, of its historical, on, uh, uh, sorry, political strategy. And of course, a constant updating of that strategy is always necessary. Part and, par part and parcel of uh, Socialist Party building is a theoretical, strategic and practical gu guide to how enter and democratize the state. Syriza paid dearly for its naive understanding of the power of the capitalist state and understand that fluctuated between an instrumentalist conception of political power to an instrumentalist sub, uh, submission to its ma almighty reproductive capacity led to a disastrous experience for us. The party of the radical left should challenge the economistic rhetoric imposed either by the international institution of fiscal supervision or simply by the neoliberal hegemonic discourse. Fourth, the occasional advances of the socialist parties should be analyzed and constantly adapted to the ever-changing conditions. In Syriza's case, for example, there was a striking failure to update its strategic appeal the political which led led to its uh, political pro, uh, prominence the the cleavage the polarization for example memorandum versus anti memorandum austerity uh, anti austerity versus the imposed austerity etc were never renewed and in fact never upgraded to an anti neoliberal, let alone to anti-capitalist discourse. Fifth, the understanding that we need a new collective organization, a new socialist party should not stop at the level of party constitution. Given that we are in search of a new 
mass socialist party of our times, where participation and accountability will be its trademark, we have to be ready to experiment with new organizational practices that will protect us from developing the devastating practices of cartel parties. We need a party organization to defend us from parliamentarism and statism. Six, needless to say that innovative political education is key in such an effort. It is also key in creatively conf confronting the party deficits and the party crisis, both in its functions at the two levels I mentioned above, as party on the ground and a party in the, in the central office. Seven, although we have known uh, since the time of Machiavelli that politics go hand in hand with communication and communicative techniques, we should not and cannot redu reduce one to the other. The party organization should always be critical supporter of the parties in government, not only as a mobilizer and uh, providing social support for every important and impossible reform and that is put by, by the government, but also should function as an active social and political critic to it. Finally, while there is no doubt that our vision should always be international and global, the party should still criticize and make constant efforts to surpass the EU fetishes in the case of the Greek, of the Greek and the European uh, radical socialist uh, and uh, break that hegemonic narrative and this fetishism around the, the European Union. And even better, you should work to develop alternative international institutions. Many of the above points were parts of Leo, Leo's contribution to a conference with the theme, the left in government, what, why, and how, held in Athens and organized by Rosa Luxemburg Institute just 10 months bef before Syriza's victory in January uh, 2015. Unfortunately, the first party, in Leo's words, the only one to dare to enter the state in the 21st century and challenge the neoliberal dominance did not listen. The hope was short-circuited. Given the deep mastery of his craft, of, the, of his uh, uh, science, of his expertise, in combination with his passionate involvement in the left, Leo knew that our road to social, to social justice would be hard and long, a marathon-like race, not a quick event to impress the audience of the six o'clock news. It is this reason that he remained to the end a passionate supporter as well as an uncompromising critic of the adventure of the socialist project of my of my country and elsewhere in the world. As the social and political and environmental state of affairs of our world deteriorates, especially after the pandemic, and the voices and concerns of social justice and social transformation become more and more dense, we will have to turn once again to insights of Leo's intellectual contribution for both encouragement and ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Mihaly, very much. Uh, Rune is the next speaker. 
Hi, uh, thank you all very much. It's a real honor to be participating today. Um, I got to know Leo over the last decade and I enjoyed uh, some uh, being uh, an Epicurean. I enjoyed some excellent dinners with him as well as uh, uh, some sessions of jazz. Uh, so I consider that a real honor. I also uh, got to see what is a, a somewhat of an uh, impish personality at times uh, uh, from him. I once uh, told him a, a moral joke and uh, he responded uh, with an inappropriate religious joke involving Christ on a cross. Um, so I want to talk about uh, I, what I think is, is best I could talk about and, and also involves uh, my uh, kind of intellectual relation, which is the nature of the working class. Because if we're talking about socialist parties, we are talking about who exactly are we organizing. And so we need to, uh, in the language of the uh, academics, problematize class. So I met Leo in uh, March of 2012 as I was covering Occupy Wall Street across the country with my partner, uh, Michelle Fawcett. Leo and the ed editors at the Socialist Register had just read, written, read an article we had written uh, entitled Occupy Invades America's Storage Set Shed. We had covered an uh, action, a direct action between a few Occupy Wall Street chapters in Southern California and unions and labor organizers. They were staging a one day action to shut down two massive Walmart uh, warehouses in the Inland Empire, the support of the workers there. I think what caught Leo's eye was we're, we were not merely covering a direct action by a group of shambolic anarchists. We were describing the political economy of the Inland Empire, a crucial node in the global economy. We were examining the lived conditions of the workers, a largely brown, black, and immigrant workforce of more than 100,000 conditions contingent workers who move goods from Asia to warehouses to trucks. The Inland Empire is vital because it is near the most active ports in the U.S., Long Beach and L.A. Goods from Asia fill warehouses in the Inland Empire that together cover more area than Manhattan. From there, the goods find their way to warehouses and store shelves into homes across the country. But if the Inland Empire is vital, the workers are not. As unbelievable as it sounds, the workers in the Walmart warehouses said they were being forced to work for 72-hour shifts, three days long. And they were also uh, saying they were encountering sy systemic wage theft, dangerous working conditions, and a lack of basic rights. Now, cities in the Inland Empire were also ground zero for the subprime mortgage crisis that the economy was still in the throes of. Entire neighborhoods in San Bernardino were uh, ghost towns. Uh, the area is nicknamed the diesel death zone because of the massive truck traffic that has given it some of the worst air quality in the world and high rates of respiratory diseases, and the police are notoriously violent in the Inland Empire, as is the norm across America. San Bernardino ranks as one of the 10 worst cities in the country to li live in. It's a glaring sign of how in the richest society in human history, those who produce the wealth are utterly disposable. And I think this is obviously because of the defeat of the left, um, that we are unable to fight back. This brief sketch of the working class in the Inland Empire prompted Leo to ask me to write about the Walmart working class. I spent months interviewing Walmart workers across the country and researching the origins of Walmart. The shift from a push to pull production economy, heavily reliant on outsourcing, the reliant of low wage female workers, an updated iteration of the Lowell Mill girls, and the downward pressure on wages, benefits, and rights. The conclusion of what turned into a small book, a 17,000 word essay, was that Walmart had created the working class in, in its image. The workers hated Walmart, not least of all because they were dependent on it for their social reproduction. Across the country, they referred to Walmart as a company town. They told similar stories. They would send their kids into McDonald's to steal napkins to use as toilet paper. They would live on as little as $25 a week for food, meeting a diet of sugar, fat, and highly refined carbohydrates that was wreaking havoc on their bodies in a manner analogous to the havoc capitalism is wreaking on the planet. Leah wanted to know where the hope was. While there were a few bright spots, such as with our Walmart and warehouse worker organizing, they never got any traction. 
Much of the reason for organized labor's failure is the power of capital, the indifference and hostility of the corporate media to organized labor, and a labor relations system heavily favored towards towards employers. But it's also important not to downplay the ossified and unimaginative politics of most union leaders, as well as their indifference and hostility to genuine rank and file militancy and democracy and community organizing. Leo's influence led me to dive into labor reporting and chronicling the lives of workers across the country for much of the last decade. It's been my version of the condition of the working class in England, and I have Leo to thank for that. From talking to thousands of workers and in-depth interviews with hundreds of them, I want to make one overall point with two aspects. It is damaging to the socialist cause to re to reduce the lives of workers purely to economic issues. In particular, there are antagonisms within the working class around gender and race that have no simple resolution. Sections of the working class have a lot to gain from perpetuating oppressions that shape the lives of most workers. Economic reductionism, the search for supposedly un universal programs that push aside or deny the system systematic oppressions experienced by most workers is anti-working class and becomes another form of identity politics that prominent groupings of today's socialist left scoffs at. Now, one important caveat, nothing I'm saying here is particularly original. You know, there are plenty of the theorists who discuss this over decades. But I think what is revealing is how these social relations I describe play out in real life. They're part of a vivid reality that workers are forced to navigate with countless decisions, large and small. One of the conclusions I come to is working the working class actually knows its interests with far greater clarity and nuance than armchair commentators realize. Now, in terms of gender, when we say working class, what's the image that comes to mind? For many, it's the, the American worker is a white male in the auto or steel or oil and gas industry. In reality, the prototypical worker is a woman. She is far more likely to work in retail or the food industry than in heavy industry. She is likely to have a poverty wage job. Millions more women work uh, in caring occupations, most of which are also low wage, childcare, healthcare, education, nursing homes. She is also like a disproportionately likely to be black, brown, or Asian. The live reality for working class women is the right wing and capital have carefully and comprehensively engineered their lives. The issue of basic social reproduction weighs on them all day, every day. How do I get to and from work? How do I feed and clothe myself and my children? How do I access childcare and medical care? What do I do about housing and education or healthy food and a healthy environment? Can I get birth control or an abortion if I need it? Let me offer two women as examples, Anna and Catherine. They're representative of many of the women I've interviewed over the last decade. Both when I interviewed them in 2017 were single moms in their 20s. They were best friends in Huntington, Indiana. They worked at the carrier plant where 700 jobs were outsourced to Mexico. This is at the same time that Trump, quote unquote, saved a similar number of jobs at carrier's plant in Indiana. They had two kids each. Anna gave birth to her first child as a 15-year-old sophomore in high school. Her father was in prison. She worked. Uh, she went to school for two years and worked an eight-hour shift at McDonald's after school. She dropped out her senior year to work in a fiberglass factory. She said it was good pay. She liked the job. She would work 80-hour weeks, but it was difficult in haz hazardous conditions. She grew up with a single mom. Sometimes she ate nothing but ramen for a, a week at a time. Catherine, who is an immigrant from Peru, had a similar story to Anna. Anna. A lot of economic issues weighed on both of them, despite the fact they earned good money. Child care, housing, car payments, health care for kids. Both were getting married. They didn't say it outright, but being in a legal marriage for them was a form of insurance. They had a second income to count on, health care if needed, greater flexibility to take care of children. For men, though, there's a much greater benefit. They don't have to sacrifice much, maybe some income. But in return, they get women to take care of their domestic reproduction. Women still do nearly 80% of that housework in the U.S. They get their children raised. They also enjoy a second income and increased opportunities for home ownership. And of course, they also get sex.
The obvious question is, what is the self-interest in men to challenge this oppressive relationship? The burdens working class women like Anna and Catherine face are distinct to their gender and reproductive and class roles. The public support systems they need have been decimated, so they are forced to rely on the private sphere. They gain benefits, but they also have real burdens of unpaid labor and risks in terms of the potential loss of income and housing from the relationship ending. This causes many working class women to endure domestic violence rather than risk the economic benefits they and their children uh, enjoy. So in many industries also, working class men enjoy sexual power over women. In particular, in the food industry, this is built into it, where millions of women de de who depend on tips have to cater to male desires, both in the back of the house and the front of the house. Many men enjoy the power and sexual benefits they derive from this, and it's also strongly reinforced by patriarchal religious ideology, uh, most widely promoted by Christian sects in the U.S. So asking working class men to dismantle this is not necessarily in their interest. In other words, the class interests of workers diverge and can even be in contradiction. Now, the second aspect is race and policing. Rather than dismiss police as agents of repression, we need to treat it as a crucial site of reproduction for much of the working class, particularly whites. By policing, I'm talking of the broad umbrella of cops, prison, criminal justice system, private security, and all the goods and services um, that go into that. It's a massive industry in the U.S. with three million directly employed, many more millions indirectly employed, and perhaps in excess of one trillion dollars in revenue generated annually. Policing is one of the best paying working class jobs with excellent benefits and retirements and low risk compared to many other working class jobs. Policing isn't just about repression, it's about profiting from bodies. Entire urban neighborhoods that are labeled economically disadvantaged are actually sites of massive capital expenditure expenditures, revenue, and profit. There's also social and racial power police derive from their role and the social status conferred to them. This is in direct contradiction to the reality of their working class vict victims. The police maintained the color line for centuries through slavery, Jim Crow, and up through the drug war that still continues today. Maintaining the color line has also meant maintaining the property line. The main form of wealth for the working class and intergenerational transfer of wealth is private home ownership. Workers and professional middle class are strongly incentivized then to maintain and support a racist system of policing, and this is reinforced by popular media depictions of policing. In, this, in these ways, racist policing becomes a desirable materially and ideologically for much of the working class. And so we have to think about how race, gender, class, and reactionary ideas are articulated through policing. Policing in particular is in a self-reinforcing relationship with private property and Protestantism. And by that, by that I'm using it as a catch-all for reactionary ideologies. Right-wing social reality is produced in the nexus of these three forces. It's where whiteness is reproduced, oppressive gender norms and patriarchy are reproduced, and divisions of among workers are reproduced. This is also a privatized sphere, and it is in private where oppression thrives. I think this is why public goods and public spaces is vital to the socialist project, but I do not see a clear path forward. I do want to warn the dangers are increasing. It is becoming increasingly difficult to have even a basic rational conversation with much of the public because the utter insanity of the QAnon cult. And if you haven't read about the QAnon, uh, phenomena, I encourage you to, because it is it is really insane beyond belief, and it is spreading. Um, I do. I just want to finish that. I wish Leo was still here because I would want to describe this to him to tell him what is happening. Because I know he would have real insight, put it in historical context, and offer genuine hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arun. Um, uh, how much time? I think we have at least 15 or 20 minutes uh, for some discussion. We have a few questions and people can submit their questions uh, in the Q&A box on the bottom of the uh, link. Uh, let me start off by, by asking uh, uh, all of the panelists uh, a question on this reimagining uh, socialist parties. 
because it seems to me that most of the discussion has been on the party side of things. You know, the organizational dilemmas, the strategic contradictions and problems of uh, uh, attempting to uh, uh, reshape the balance of power within the state uh, to transform uh, uh, the institutions uh, and processes of, uh, of the state. And there hasn't been much discussion of socialism and what we mean by socialism or what people might mean by socialism. And it, it, it seems to me at this point, it's very unclear uh, 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 what socialism uh, might be. You know, I think many people have differing uh, uh, ideas of what socialism is. Some people obviously think that Medicare for all is uh, the same, you know, is socialism. Uh, uh, you know, it's a, a typically a right wing uh, uh, position. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of the um, uh, leading figures uh, in, in uh, electoral politics that identify as socialist uh, use language that would not be out of step with, uh, you know, I mean, the, the Italian fascists, don't forget, had as their motto, uh, a work family nation. And there's a lot of this kind of right wing moralism that often creeps in. Uh, uh, to uh, the discourse of working families, you know the uh, the dignity, the the, the pri you know the the, the uh, primacy of work, the dignity of work, as opposed to uh, the lazy uh, and so forth. So I think it's really an open question today: what socialism is in the minds of people who might identify today as socialism? How, in the sense of parties, as educational? Uh, 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 you know, in the Gramscian sense, of course, of a party, which is main purpose, I think, as uh, uh, Megan uh, very much alluded to and talked about class formation, you know, for Gramsci, the party is there to educate uh, 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 how people can be, you know, what is the purpose of democratizing the state? You know, is it democracy for its own sake or there is something about how we will live in the world, you know, in a substantively different way that will create a much more unalienated or a uh, free way of, uh, of living as a community. And I think, you know, uh, how the question of uh, climate change fits into our understanding of socialism today. Uh, uh, you know, what, one, uh, I think, area now in the context of the pandemic where the left uh, has uh, failed is that there is no left by and large uh, 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 take on the pandemic. There are by some individual academics uh, 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 or scholars, but the, uh, in terms of uh, 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 the party politics, ele uh, electoral uh, strategies and so forth, there's no one talking about capitalist agriculture or uh, uh, you know, the causes of pandemics and uh, forms of consumption and how these may lead to things. So I think this is one general question for all of the panel you know, the question of party is one part of the equation, but what about uh, socialism? What is it? What could it be? Why should anyone want to be a socialist uh, in the current conjuncture? I'm happy to tackle um, one aspect, and I won't address the entire scope of the question. Um, you hit on something that I think is important and um, regretted that I wasn't able to touch in my original comments, which is, um, what is DSA's role vis-a-vis um, -vis a sort of minimum program? What is socialist, what is organized socialist role vis-a-vis -vis a minimum program? Uh, it is true that elected officials that are either aligned with DSA or that are sort of a gen part of the general kind of progressive Bernie-esque um, upswing, um, some of them identify as socialists and it seems like they are primarily putting forward a raft of reforms that together we would not say constitute socialism. I mean, frankly, they're quite compatible with capitalism in many cases. Um, you can even see in certain contexts that they would strengthen capitalism by pacifying capital labor relations. So there's some real danger there. Um, and yet that does not lead me, for example, to say that like DSA should up the bar, the bar for a minimum program because the truth is that the American working class, and I'm just speaking of the United States, but I think it's true everywhere, um, 
is incredibly demoralized and its expectations are very low. And one thing that Leo was very good at is just doing a sort of like conjunctural analysis and asking what kind of political activity would be appropriate for any given social configuration. And being sober about our configuration means that, for example, the fight for Medicare for all um, is something that's going to reach people who are actually pretty depoliticized, demobilized, demoralized, and so on. Um, we see it, you know, and if we were to implement Medicare for all, I think the, the, the hope of both campaigning for it and implementing it would be that not simply that we would be able to make sure that people have health care, which is incredibly important. Um, but to reinstall a kind of sense of the common good, which we could then use as a springboard for educating people, for building class consciousness around socialism. One of the phrases that I like the most, um, Robbie Nelson, a DSA member, wrote this, wrote an article for Jack Ben, I don't know, a few years ago, called Engines of Solidarity. The idea that um, these kinds of reforms that on their own basically tend to simply, you know, um, fix problems in society, including in capitalist society, such as making sure that everyone has health care, um, we can reimagine them as potential engines of solidarity. Um, you know, bringing people who are atomized and isolated into a condition of awareness about their codependence, co mutual mutual dependence, and um, their need to fight together across lines of difference in order to preserve gains that make a real difference in their personal life. Um, now, we can't stop there. So I've hopefully made the case that I think it's good that socialists are like, yes, Medicare for all, and yes, you know, tuition-free public college and trade school and this kind of minimum program. I don't think that we should um, simply turn up our nose and say that's not real socialism. I think we have to, you know, reach people, um, reach into the sort of depths of demoralization and speak to people on the basis of what they need to survive. And that's, that's um, you know, it's good for us to be championing a minimum program, even if it seems on, on the face of it, like it might be compatible with capitalism. But what do we do next, right? So that it's not like um, we obviously it's not sufficient. And the question that that you raised of political education is really critical. Um, I think that ideally our um, elected leaders would be engaging in political education of their own. I'm not entirely sure that that's happening right now. Um, that would be something that hopefully we can actually. Um, generate you know new politicians in the future who see that as their actual mandate i don't think that we have that at the moment i think that like bernie sanders and aoc have done a great job of raising expectations and building confidence in the working class and changing the the sense of um, what people ought to be able to expect from a civilized society, right? But I, I'm not sure that there's a lot of mass socialist political education for which I'm not gonna, you know, discard discard them as like useful presences in American politics, but somebody has to take up that task. So I hope a number of things. Well, let's put it this way. Ideally, DSA needs to be running its own homegrown candidates. We need to be running people who, um, for office, who we recognize from doing the hard work of building our socialist organizations and who we who we know for a fact understand socialist politics and see reforms the way that I just described as springboards for building solidarity and building class consciousness. Um, right now, DSA is, is kind of stuck because there's a huge generational gap um, and a lot of our best activists simply are not like ready in a lot of different ways to run for office and people are quite reticent. Um, of course people are reticent. I think it would be kind of um, a red flag if people weren't reticent because usually the people who do in DSA go, um, hi, I just got here and I'd like to run for office and I'd like your backing. I don't share our political perspective and they're not particularly devoted to our political project. They just like to bring us into their electoral coalition to help them win, right? Um, the I think that we should be running home, ideally running homegrown candidates who can take on this task of political education and who can actually popularize the minimum program in a way that connects it to the maximum program and actually builds um, a deeper understanding of what what's wrong with capitalism, how it functions, and why socialism is, is a better alternative. Um, in order to do that, we need to be doing political education inside of our organizations. Um, in DSA, the D D it's very um, disjointed. Um, there are some chapters that have incredibly rigorous and exciting political education programs, and there are other chapters that don't. Um, the national organization does do some political education, um, but frankly, DSA, I think, is like a pretty decentralized organization, unfortunately, um, and so it's not reaching the membership the way that we would like it to. I was very fortunate to be in a chapter in my 
early years of so being a socialist activist and organizer where we were doing sustained political education. And then I eventually developed my own capacities as a elected leader of the political education committee, putting on night schools and, you know, like holding reading groups and discussion groups and um, trying to make, trying to bring other people in. Um, and not every chapter has that. Um, so that's kind of the task. I think we should start from like, how do we actually reform our own organizations so that we're actually producing politically educated cadre? Then we can run them for office and then they can actually use elected office to be performing that same political education function on a much larger platform. Good, anyone else wants to uh, I guess I can just, I, I can, uh, echo very strongly what Megan just said, which I think was just absolutely brilliantly put in terms of the DSA uh, context in the United States. So I'll just maybe comment on a different dimension of the question, Peter, which I think is a good question because, I mean, so what I tried to kind of emphasize in my comments was the difference between a social democratic perspective to reforms and a socialist perspective. And I think what Megan was just articulating is exactly the kind of non-reformist reform approach that I was trying to, to gesture towards. Um, so more broadly, I think, you know, socialism today, you know, the question is not, do we want universal health care? The question is, how do we connect universal health care to something broader? And so part of your question then is, what is that something broader and what are we actually trying to build towards? And that's a very, very difficult question. Um, generally speaking, you know, I, I have cast this along with Leo and many of, many of the people coming from that tradition of socialism, democratizing the state as a means to democratize the economy. So what does that mean? Well, the state evolved particular capacities over time in order to manage capitalism. It didn't, it didn't just drop out of the sky in its current form. The state developed over centuries to and it evolved particular capacities to manage and navigate a contradictory capitalist economy and articulate the power of the capitalist class. So we need to build either to transform those capacities or build entirely new state institutions to promote democratic economic planning instead of managing capitalism, to promote public control over investment instead of reinforcing private power. So the question then becomes, how does that actually happen? Like, what does it mean to democratize the Treasury Department? What does it mean to democratize the Department of Commerce? What, would, what does it mean to look at the Federal Reserve and say this is undemocratic? Do we just wanna elect Federal Reserve boards of directors? I mean, that, that's, that sounds good on the surface of it, but it's far too simplistic. I mean, there's, there's a, for example, a great book by Robert Reich, Locked in the Cabinet, about his years as labor secretary in the Clinton administration, in which he recounts a conversation sitting, uh, a, 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 an imagined conversation sitting down across the table from Alan Greenspan at lunch and, and Alan Greenspan saying, well, what would you rather me do? And Robert Wright kind of answers, well, I, you know, I, if I were in your position, I would probably be doing much the same. So if we were to elect elite leaders of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, what would they be doing different than what's currently happening with the Federal Reserve? 0% interest rates, for example. What, you know, the, the, the constraints and the structures of the state are what's at stake here, not just who's leading it. So we need to begin to reimagine state institutions and how they're organized, not just, re, not just challenge who the specific leaders of those institutions are. So obviously the first step is to do something like nationalizing sectors of the economy or using uh, something like a, a Green New Deal as a way of extending democratic control over wider sectors of, of, of industrial production. So rather than just giving corporations massive subsidies to develop green tech, actually use state uh, intervention to contribute to green technology development or infrastructures or whatever to leverage greater public control over those corporations. So they have to uh, implement uh, uh, planning agreements or uh, using uh, uh, municipal or, or federal state uh, victories as a way of promoting uh, uh, the development of workers' cooperatives, you know, financing workers' cooperatives and, and other more democratic forms of, of economic organization than what we currently have. So the big, the big one would be nationalizing the financial system, right? Um, but again, like, you know, Mitterrand in France, you know, nationalized the banks and what happened? Nothing. They remain organized exactly as capitalist banks, just now run by the state. Same thing with the social democratic approach to nationalizing industries across Europe. Nationalizing industries in itself, that shows us, isn't enough. We have to fundamentally rethink how these industries are run, how they're organized, how workers participate in their governance, and how communities and the society as a whole decides 
what's to be produced, where it's to be produced, and how it's to be produced. Um, this is a very, very tall order. But to me, the entry point here is, is to a large extent, things like the Green New Deal that can actually allow us to, rather than just giving subsidies to business, gain control over those assets. Next time there's a financial crisis, rather than just bailing out the banks, take control of the banks, you know, nationalize the banks, and then start thinking about what it means to, to democratize them. And this extends all the way to public services, right? Like part of the problem with social democracy in Europe was that the public services that they implemented were uh, shitty, alienating, top-down, bureaucratic, that's why they, part of the reason why they could be cut so easily when the neoliberal period came. We need to find ways to imagine a completely different form of public service provision by the state, a more democratic form of public service provision, whereby the, the public sector employees in the state carrying out those services relate to their jobs in a fundamentally different way than just being in an alienating bureaucracy and relate to the communities that they're serving in a fundamentally different way. Like, what does it mean to democratize the education system, to democratize the curriculum? To you know, every aspect of, of, of state organization and public service provision needs to be rethought in a very deep and profound way. And so that's only like a, a, a kind of like vague hint at where I think the conversation needs to be. Obviously, they don't have any specific proposals, but that is how I think of uh, socialism. Uh, let me start summarizing some of the questions in the, in the board. Uh, Michali, perhaps you could, there are a few questions about Leo's support of Syriza, especially after uh, 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 the, re the the referendum and the the uh, uh, what is uh, often termed the betrayal of Syriza by going against the outcome of the referendum. So there are a few questions on that. How can we uh, account for uh, Leo's continued support of Syriza even after that moment? Okay, uh, I already hinted on that. Leo had a very penetrating and a very um, participatory, I would say, understanding of uh, Greek society. Uh, he knew very well that we uh, cannot sort of leave the Euro or anything like that. He knew the limitations of of, of of that uh, of that project of that 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 road um the greek society is structured so much and it's so much embedded in the european uh, dependency that that was impossible however i would like to uh, remind the people who are so uh in a to me, in a very arbitrary and an historical way, critical of Syri of uh, of series of that decision and that moment, that series two months after uh, misusing, if you like, the verdict of uh, the debate of uh, the referendum, uh, went to elections and won. He asked for the popular support to continue. That's not, that's not a, a betray. From then on, the, you know, one can have a million criticism and um, I think I also hinted or I was quite explicit on that. Um, so Leo was exactly this. He was supportive because he understood uh, uh, the limits, the capacities, the preparations of, uh, of uh, assuming power in uh, January uh, 2015. At the same time, he was critical of not doing a number of things uh, or not performing some things that they were outside the obligations and the... And the um, uh, of the um, uh, of, uh, imposed by IMF and uh, the, the European uh, European Bank, etc. So uh, it was a critic and supportive because he knew it, it's it's to be radical does not mean to operate on the basis of some abstract ideas which are interesting at the, at you know, in terms of structuring and uh, debating our theory, 
to be radical, it's to also to be uh, realistic. It has to be what, what what is what is good for Greece at that point. It was probably not uh, 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 the same exactly the same strategy as uh, the Podemos or Bloc or or or, or a, a, in other in other occasions. However, what was missing in uh, the series as project was all the things that I mentioned and more that and these are the things and these are the things we, we can learn from in our effort to uh, to make a dent um, uh, to to uh, Greek capitalism or the European capitalism etc. So I don't subscribe to treason or uh, to capitulation or all that kind of stuff. It, it had to be done like that. It was not treated properly, is not treated with great imagination. We didn't probably ex explore the, the capacities of, uh, the, uh, of our movement. And, um, but uh, however, uh, we did ignore the capacities of the of the Greek people, and uh, that was very uh, very important. Okay, good. Uh, Aru, maybe you could address there. Are, there are a couple of questions about the current situation uh, on the ground. Uh, uh, mutual aid movements, uh, 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 solidarity movements, and also, of course, the possibility of you know having been in some senses, of course, liberated from the workplace, uh, even though with, you know, these uh, 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 machines that we are saddled with, it's not as if we, that we are uh, liberated from the demands on our time and so forth. The possibilities of the current crisis for building certain momentum towards uh, uh, solidarity movements, movements from the left and so forth. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's a, a two-sided nature to sloganeering is it can capture people's imagination in a good way. Um, you know, Workers of the World Unite, uh, defund the police, but uh, by itself it is not in and of itself, it's not a program, you know, but I, I do kind of enjoy the, the slogan that we're uh, striving for um, uh, gay automated luxury space communism. Uh, you know, that it's, we have to move beyond just like the notion that socialist politics is biological uh, reproduction. But, you know, as someone who whose work is much more, whose work is on the ground um, and has been, you know, I've been following social movements closely, political movements for 30 years. I, I mean, I, I just do have to say like, you know, frankly, I've, I have never seen such despair um, or felt uh, uh, such despair as a present moment. Um, you know, we, we have this incredibly episodic nature of protests. Last year, I wrote a piece for, I, I never know how to pronounce the name, Jadalia, Jadalia, um, the, the Middle East North African website, um, where I'm, I tried to historicize the, the nature of social and political movements. You know, if we go back a uh, hundred years, 150 years, um, movements are, are, are coming out of uh, workers. And, you know, I think we don't often appreciate enough how um, it's, they were often shaped by specific ethnicities, people who shared language, culture, um, religion, various affinities, but so much of it had to do with the geography of scale, right? People who are living in the same neighborhoods, who are sharing uh, resources. Post-World War II, you know, even though labor seemed strong, it was, it was definitely waning, and we start to move more into a civil society uh, type of organizing um, where you have defined groups and leaderships who are often amplified um, uh, through mass media. So stuff like, you know, campaign for nuclear disarmament, the civil rights movement, feminist movement. In the digital age, um, everything has just been uh, blown apart. And what I consistently see across the ground, especially post-Occupy, is that movement organizing is coming through people 
um, utilizing social media, and I don't think we can blame technology, um, but at the same time, it's kind of the worst form of organizing that there is. Um, I think a big part of the reason is that uh, the model of uh, mass protest um, has just been um, utterly defeated and demoralizing. And, you know, really the last gasp of that, I think, was uh, the Iraq anti-war movement. And that was just a disaster the way um, the two main formations, uh, United for Peace of Just Justice and Answer, um, really organize that they never um took more of a a, a confrontational uh, approach to the state and what occupy wall street did was return that confrontational approach to the state but now the left is ca caught in this type of dilemma where the most dynamic and militant sections of the public um, and a lot of it overlap with the working class want to have this confrontational destructive perhaps even violent um, confrontation with the state with the state but because of its nature um, no legal organization is willing to do that so what you have is you these these individuals really who use social media who have a following or who are able to leverage a large following very quickly call for protests and this is what I've been seeing particularly um, with the you know George Floyd uh, uh, protests um, you you have like movements literally groups rise and fall within a couple of weeks. They gain national attention and then they blow apart because then they get also attacked by people on social media. So what we have is this kind of production of personalities, of grift, of opportunism. Um, and it's to the point, say, in, in Portland, which is a leading edge for really a lot of the worst behaviors, um, the, you know, Last a year ago, there were millions of people in the street. Now we're down to dozens. Um, often they're carrying assault rifles. Um, they're engaging in nihilistic violence. They've done shit like attack the historical society repeatedly, um, spray paint stuff like no more history. This is Pol Pot year zero shit. Um, you know, destroy civilization. Um, and they kind of own the streets. And people have been chased away. People have been. Um, cowed into submission. People are confused about what to do. But the problem is, where do we kind of reproduce a mass organization? And I know um, from people I talk to in a number of different chapters, again, Portland is one of them, but there are other ones of DSA, that there is just vicious infighting among um, uh, various sections. Um, and, you know, it's, it's I call it like uh, zero to Maoism in, in 60 seconds, um, that I see people like moving through the whole phase of um, uh, what what's the book, uh, Revolution is in the Air, where, you know, the new left uh, descended into uh, Maoism uh, during the 70s. And I see individuals who two years ago were, were anarchists are, are now like, you know, uh, hardcore Leninists and, and starting to talk about like people like using Maoist ideology. Um, I think if you're not fighting over an actual base, you're, you're going to get wrapped up in either this type of nihilism or these type of like abstract ideological discussions. And that the, the, the project remains actually improving people's lives, but being in meaningful solidarity um, with, with communities. Like, you know, one of the things that I'm, um, let's just say bothered by is not enough discussion of, of immigrants as, as central um, to the working class project, given the role they play in, in the economy. You know, and we saw it this last year, especially with the food supply system was in peril and food workers, you know, um, in the slaughterhouses, in the farms, you know, there was talk of food workers in the slaughterhouses. There was hardly any talk of the 2 million agricultural laborers and just how, you know, severe the uh, COVID crisis was in farms across the country, that we don't talk about these sections of, of the working class at all. And we and if we're not talking about them, we're certainly not in solidarity with them. And I think we, we need to really think more what is meaningful solidarity um, with the working class and who is the working class. 
very good. I'm getting all kinds of messages that we're running out of time. Uh, so I think we'll have to cut the discussion off at this point. Uh, I think there's a, there's a musical uh, selection, I think, uh, coming up next that will lead us into the next panel. So thank you, thank you very much. I want to thank all the participants, uh, all the, everyone who was, uh, uh, you know, asked questions and uh, 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 was present for the, the panel, and we'll uh, begin the uh, next panel uh, shortly.